if I like started and went through this entire thing um and then like at the end of this all like this is gonna take like an hour and a half at least like if I if I went through all that yeah I I would have just fucking screamed dude uh anyway (laughs) yeah yeah uh anyway (laughs) so you can see this all good like Alrighty, Rue. Uh, who do we have joining us this evening? Yes, I believe I did. I should be streaming in on Twitch. Uh, do you want to check that for me real quick? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my god, I... Sweet fucking Jesus, dude. I also do be... Sh- we we do be sharing this tab in Discord so that y'all can see it all right. Whew. Oh, thank sweet sassy molassy. Alrighty. Um what Oh <laughs> Poor. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna be able to read chat the entire time we're doing this. So um uh, if if Rio has like comments or questions, please someone relay them to me. Like, I I I need you guys to understand like how genuinely scuffed my setup is right now. I I am screen sharing to you in Discord, while I am live streaming this on Twitch solely so that I can have a vod of this later. I did. Why? Look what I. It says I'm still streaming in. Pourquoi? Pourquoi? Haha, <laughs> no she ain't. I, oh sweet, sweet merciful Jesus. Oh, Alexis is in in my Twitch chat though. She, Alexis, <laughs> Alexis stands Rachel the hero just as I stand Soul Punk. Um, but yeah, I, I, honestly, Sam, if your internet connection is is anything to say of this, this should this is, should show you part of why this is so fucking scuffed. I am streaming this to you guys, like screen sharing my presentation to you in Discord. Um, but I'm also, you know, recording this so I can have a VOD later. Um, I don't, I can't see, like, speaker notes with the way I am screen recording this because I want it to look, you know, neat and not have any of my mad ramblings, uh, to view by the public. Um, so I also have this presentation open on my phone with the fucking Google, like, like, um, not Sheets, but, like, the Google Slides app so that I can read my, my speaker notes. But, you know, I'm on an iPhone to do that, so it's really small and hard to read. <laughs> it's, like, there was no way I was going to be able to, like, write, like, flashcards for this shit. There's just so much. Anyway, um, are we all pretty much, you know, ready to go? Yes. First names. Okie dokie, Kane. And then Rio is is silent, so he's fine. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> I can't believe Rio's corpse dragged itself to my dream SMP lecture. What if Oh. Absolutely will do, pal. Man, Rio will be missed. Anyway, uh <laughs> Hey guys, it's lecture time. Uh, Mothers and fuckers of the jury, class is in session. Today we'll be summarizing the dream SMP lore for my friends because I am apparently sadistic enough to even attempt this uh, by Rachel the Hero. Uh, I hope you guys have, like, yeah, it's it's for Chloe. It's for, I'm doing this for you, homie, but also for my own ego at this point. I hope you guys have a lot of... <laughs> Thank you, fam. 
I hope you guys have a lot of time set aside for this because we are in this for the long haul. Um, also, this PowerPoint is a mess. Uh, before we start, I would like to apologize to God and every professor I've ever had who tried to teach me how to structure a PowerPoint because I said, fuck it, to all convention. Um, am I mostly writing in full sentences? Yes. Should I be doing that? No. Do I care? Also, no. Um, my main sources, because I did not do a citation slide for my Blockman roleplay lecture, uh, most of my sources are from the Dream SMP fandom wiki and also SMP update on Twitter. I physically could not have pulled this off without these resources, and I watched most of this, like what you are about to see, happen in real time. I use a lot of pictures from the wiki, as well as animatics by several artists. Uh, if I do not specify where something is from or who made it, please just assume I am pulling from the wiki. So what exactly are we covering here this evening? I will be going over what is the Dream S&P, why it has this whack-ass popularity that always gets on your Twitter trending page. I will be going over the cast, as well as the cast, the factions encountered in the world of the story, the free live system, Tales of the s &P, and of course, the timeline and lore summary with all those era categories that you see to the right of your screen. I am slightly modifying the wiki timeline to be a bit more cohesive so it's not quite a one-to-one. -one. It's still covering the same events. I'm just, you know, kind of categorizing them differently. I'm also not really covering different server events like the guest stars they've had, like Ninja or KSI. I'm not covering like the deal or no deal games or the Mr. Beast Taco Bell scavenger hunt. I'm mostly sticking to canon lore events for brevity's sake. Not that any of this is particularly brief to begin with. This entire presentation is 56 slides long, and that's ridiculous. And after this, I will have so much free time, it's not even funny. Holy shit. So what exactly is the Dream SMP? The Dream SMP is a survival multiplayer server owned by Dream. You know, Minecraft manhunt dude. Homeless Teletubby. Rabid Twitter fans, um, featuring a no face man. Uh, it is a private survival multiplayer server featuring a variety of content creators with different and varying skill levels in the beloved game of Minecraft. It's kind of commonly known for its interesting roleplay storyline, its unique method of storytelling, its impressive combat events, and its genuinely incredible survival mode builds. Pretty much anything goes on the server except going to the end is forbidden. On the top left of my screen, you will be seeing Lamanberg, which was taken from the Twitter of Phil's of Minecraft. Top right is the Temple of the Undying from the Twitter of Foolish Gamers. And bottom left is Eret's Castle by, you know, Eret on Twitter. So, um, why the fuck is this fucking Minecraft roleplay server so fucking popular? Um... My general joke theory is that each arc in it kind of corresponds to a different popular musical, and that's why people like it. Like, Lamanberg's just one big Hamilton reference, Exile sometimes feels like the Heathers, the present arc's just Little Shop of Horrors, like, full stop. And as a musical fan, I like that. Um, but the real answer to that question, I think, is it started during the Minecraft Renaissance, with a bunch of hugely popular content creators all in one place, in the middle of a global tragedy that confined many people indoors, the internet is their only place of like reprieve and refuge. You fucking tell me why you think it's popular, Jesus. Um, the fandom for this series is also absolutely ballistic. They're hugely talented in making animations, comics, fan art, fan fiction, even music surrounding the events of the story which then reaches a broader audience because, you know, it's all over the internet. The story even has a few very, very popular AUs. Um, some examples are, you know, saddest animatics. They're kind of like the base level exposure people get to the series. You have creators like Precious Jewel Moore and Derivacat who make music surrounding the events of the series. You have um, animatic makers like Late August and Channel Without a Name who make animatics about the story set to other unrelated music. You've got users like Underscore Toad who hand draw animatics and then stop motion them. And then you have users like Sock and Chewy Pepsi Cola on Twitter who are responsible for two of the most popular AUs in the fandom, which are the Zombie Apocalypse AU and Blue Sonder. I'm not covering those today. We don't have time. Um, Dream, the Dream SMP has also got this very, very unique improvisational storytelling format due to the multiple perspectives 
has. Each streamer has a different understanding of the plot and the events of the story, meaning each viewpoint is essentially a self-contained and unique story of that player, while also kind of being a part of that larger world narrative. Everyone's their own protagonist, but for us, they're an unreliable narrator. Like, you can have, like, stories and, like, movies and TV shows that cover the same event from, you know, different viewpoints, but you don't get that in real time like you do here. And I don't know of any other piece of media that has this aspect at its disposal, and I find it absolutely fascinating. What the characters know or not in canon often leads to drama because the audience has knowledge of multiple perspectives, but, you know, each content creator only knows what is presented to them. This kind of, like, unique perspective also extends to characters we don't get to see, like Dream, who doesn't stream his perspective, so we don't know his motives, Callahan, who doesn't talk, and then off-screen events like letters the characters wrote to each other. We only understand what they are willing to present to us from another character's perspective. So we get an air of mystery from them. Uh, the story does have a script, but that's a script in quotation marks um, because there are certain story beats that the cast generally agrees need to be met, but getting from point A to point B is done entirely through situational improv. It's a lot like a and d campaign, which is why I think a lot of people like it because D&D is fun as hell. Um, so... Spoiler warning for the story of the Dream SMP, character motivations, character death, the plot. I'm covering everything from the beginning of the server to the day before this recording. Uh, that would be March 6th. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here. Um, so um, the next four slides are just the cast in 10-ish words or less. Uh, don't worry too much about remembering all these people. They don't all appear at once. And I will be pausing to specify who joins the server and when upon getting it, getting to it in the timeline. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on all these people for brevity's sake, but I do have a few people I do want to single out. Like Dream, who is our main antagonist. He is a conniving fucking villain and he is good at it. He's one of the most powerful people on the server and he's extremely manipulative. His Goal, as far as we know, is to have everyone be one big happy family and to stop splitting off into factions. However, his methods of doing so are, um, you know, willing to resort to torture and violence and murder. Fun shit. Dream is also technically in control of three-ish other sub-characters, including Dream XD, who is considered to be a separate entity from him. He's basically a demigod, yet stops people from going to the end and has access to creative mode. You have Drista, who's Dream's little sister, who just, she's a canonical entity, by the way. She'll just take over Dream's account for the day, cause general chaos, kill people, vandalize things, and then she'll hand out sick loot before she leaves. Um, she's shown up twice, and she's just genuinely funny when she does, and I cannot wait for her to show up again. Uh, then we have the Dreamins. One time Dream got possessed, and then someone tried to do something about it, and I'm pretty sure they're gone, but I don't know. Hasn't come up in a while. I'm very confused. You've got Goggy. <laughs> yes. We will get to Mexican. <laughs> Don't you worry. We will talk about Mexican Dream. <laughs> God rest him. Um, so <laughs> the, the running joke in the fandom is that pretty much everything after the election arc is technically George's fault because of how drastically different the story would have been if George just didn't sleep through it. Um, he was also king of the world for a while, but then he decided he didn't want to be part of the lore that much, and he caused a crisis live on stream. It got resolved, but, like, some warning would have been fucking great. Um, then we got Sapnap, who I really think people sleep on as a character, because when he isn't murdering any pet within a 50-block radius, he's actually really, really interesting. He's a character who is, as of late, has been really, really questioning his emotions and if the people he considers his friends are even his friends at all. Also, he's responsible for the um, Squeaks conflict, which is my favorite thing that has ever happened on this fucking server. It is a 15-minute long game of keep away to try and stop Sapnap from murdering Tubbo and his new pet fox, and I think that's really, really fucking funny. I think he's neat. Um, then we have Callahan, who does not ever speak. We've never heard Callahan's voice. They just 
type in chat. They were briefly George a squire, but, you know, George decided he didn't want to be king anymore. Um, Callahan, despite not speaking, is actually really, really good with comic relief. They just die whenever they don't want to be a part of something. And that is direct action in a very fun way. There is Awesome Dude, a.k.a. just Sam is fine. More like Handsome Dude, because he did a face reveal recently, and body positivity is important. Uh, Sam's kind of a fucking freak with Redstone and is one of the richest dudes on the server. Um, I also like to say he is one of the, like, four functional adults on the server because he kind of goes out of his way to prevent the younger characters from dealing with strife if he is able to intervene. He is also the warden of the prison, which he helped design. Um, I do want to shout out that um, Sam uses the proceeds from his Twitch stream to fund an educational project that teaches kids how to code using Minecraft, and I think that's genuinely sweet and deserves a bit more attention. Um, Sam also has a sub-character called Sam Nook, who is a Tom Nook analog that speaks in a little kind of like Animal Crossing voice, uh, who gives traumatized youths fun projects and building activities to do to help recover from, you know, their tragic backstory. Sam's really cool. I like him a lot. That's that's one of my favorite white boys, I think. Uh, after that, we have Alyssa, who was one of the only girls on the server for a very, very long time. Um, but she's been gone a while. She's not really into the whole streaming thing. Um, but she seems nice, and personally, I hope she's doing well. After that, we have Honk, whose character is kind of like a trickster and prankster, but also like a suave businessman. He might be possessed right now. I don't know. It's a bit up in the air. Um... Hawk as a person is really, really funny, and I wish I could catch his live streams more often. Unfortunately, due to time zones, I am often unconscious when he is live, um, and that's unfortunate. But, you know, VODs are there for a reason. Fun fact about Punk, he is by far the most griefed player on this server by a wide, wide margin. I mean, close to like 40% of the things he builds gets destroyed. Also, he has a lot of dead pets, but don't worry, Punk, it happens to the best of us. We are on page two of the cast now. Do I have any questions so far? Cash money. After that, we have Bad Boy Halo, a.k.a. Bad or BBH. Um, he likes to call people Muffinhead when he is mad at them because he dislikes cursing. As a character, Bad is the nominal leader of a faction called the Badlands. He's usually very, very nice and helpful to people, but he is currently possessed. After that, we have Tommy in it, our, you know, de facto protagonist and catalyst of most of the events on the server. As a character, he is quite troublesome and prideful, and that leads to him getting very, very traumatized. But he's really not a bad kid. He's just a kid who does dumb things, right? After that, we have Tabo, who is an expert spy and was also the one-time president. He's a lot smarter as a character than he lets on, and he's quite optimistic. Unfortunately for him, he's a bit of a pushover, and that made him a kind of ineffective leader. After that, we have Fundy, whose character is just a fox wearing Jotaro's Part 3 outfit. Um, Fundy as a person is not actually a furry, but people like to poke fun at him for that. As a character, he's quite mischievous and likes to prank people, but all in all, he's kind of a true neutral, you know, works for themselves type person. Every character who's kind of supposed to take responsibility for him kind of abandons him. He's canonically Wilbur's kid. Um, IRL, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a family tree. I don't want to talk about it. I will, I will mention relations when they come up and nothing more. Um, IRL, Fundy is an extremely talented coder. He figured out how to program, um, screen capturing in Minecraft. So whatever he is recording can appear in the game through particle effects, which is kind of amazing because he can do like real time camera work in the game, which is kind of fucking ballistic. Uh, after that, we have one of my personal favorite characters, which is unfortunate because he's not involved all that often. We have Puns, who is a former Knight to George, but more so serves as a mercenary. This man's policy is $20 is $20. If you pay him, he will do whatever the fuck you want him to do. He previously worked as Dream Spy. Unfortunately for him right now, he is currently possessed. Um, also, I think we personally, as people from the northeastern region of the United States, can trust him more because he is also from New England. He is an ally and a friend. After that, 
Yeah. After that, we have Purpled. He's um, mostly known for being an absolute fucking freak in Bed Wars, you know, the game that everyone likes on Hypixel. Uh, as a character, he is a mercenary who is currently hunting down Captain Puffy. We'll get to it. Um, but he's also kind of relegated to the back burner lore wise because he's fairly disinterested in politics. After that, we have fan favorite character Wilbur Soot. You guys remember Soot House? The, the, the Reddit reading channel? That's him. That's, that's Wilbur from Soot House. He branched out. Good for him. Uh, Wilbur was the former president of Lemanberg, and as a character, he's a great leader, but he lost his mind. He's also Fundy's dad, and he's dead. Ghostbur is Wilbur's sub character. Yeah, it happens to the best of us. Um, Ghostbur is Wilbur's sub-character, and he's basically what's left of Wilbur in the physical plane. Ghostbur is an amnesiac who represses all negativity. He physically is unable to remember most of the bad things that happen to him in life. Wilbur's big thing is he notices when other characters are getting distressed and then hands them a piece of blue dye, telling them it will absorb all their sorrow. Another fan favorite character after that is the man, the myth, the legend, Jay Schlatt. Yeah, that Jay Schlatt. Jay Sh <laughs> you have heard of the most cancelable man on Twitter. Unfortunately, he's so fucking funny. <laughs> he's so good. Oh. Uh, yes, yes he is. Goat man. Uh, Jay Schlatt declares himself emperor because he is, as a character, incredibly manipulative and oppressive. However, as a lawful evil, there's nothing anyone can do about it. He will continue to do bad things because he was duly elected. He will stop doing bad things the second he is unelected. But until then, he is impatient, cruel, and violently Republican. Unfortunately for him, he is dead. After that, we have Skeppy, who as a character is quite cocky, but is loyal to the Badlands. Unfortunately for him, he has been consumed by the blood vines, which are the things that keep possessing people. So I want you to really do something about those. What's up? <laughs> hey, Chloe, have you ever seen the famous Broadway musical Little Shop of Horrors? <laughs> we'll talk about it. It's it's a thing that's going on in some of the more recent arcs of the series, and believe me, we will be covering it. Um, but... <laughs> I wish it did! It does talk, so who's to say it might be in the cards in the future? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Um, so the next character we have is... Eret, who uh, has arguably uttered the most famous line, like, pop culture-wise for the series, which is, it was never meant to be. Eret betrayed his fellow freedom fighters for Lemanberg to become king of the SMP, but it's kind of not as cracked up as he thought it would be, so they are currently desperate to make amends. They are also studying necromancy to bring back Wilbur. Uh, Eret is really, really popular outside of the server as an LGBT streamer. Um, and one of the big things that they are doing right now is they are using the proceeds of Twitch donations to buy viewers binders if they want them, which is very, very kind. Um, Jack fucking Manifold is a miracle. <laughs> um, the only reason Jack was on this server is because Tommy and Tubbo complained to every person who had opt to get him on. Um, and very recently, Jack was able to quit his day job, and he's now streaming full-time, which is very, very nice. He's funny, and I think he deserves that. Um, as a character, Jack is kind of fair weather. His allegiance will literally shift day to day, depending on what he thinks of him, uh, he thinks he can get out of it. Uh, he's also quite comical. Um, he technically also did the most metal thing on the server yet, which was dying and then saying no, and then coming back. <laughs> Um, he's quite misguided in his anger, though, but that's a plot thing that we'll talk about later. After that, we have Ms. Nikki Niachu, who I think deserves more attention as a character because she is the best character in this fucking series. Uh, Nikki, at one point in time, was the true neutral good of the server, but right now she's kind of blinded by grief and anger, and it's making her do very, very unhealthy things that she is only as of late starting to recover from. After that, we have Quackity, a.k.a. Big Q, who canonically has the fattest ass in the cabinet of the government. Uh, Quackity as a character is a career politician who prefers to gain their power and influence through politics and economics. They're not a particularly hostile individual, 
but they can be very, very easily set off to do less than savory things for what they want. Quackity's sub-character is Mexican Dream, who is tragically deceased and was murdered by Dream for being kind of annoying. Buenos noches, sweet prince, and may a flight of angels sing thee to thy rest. Do you have questions about Mexican Dream, Chloe? Yep, Mexican Dream. <laughs> Mexican Dream is one of the three canonically dead characters who are currently in the afterlife. <laughs> Mexican Dream is a very nice young man. We will get to Mexican Dream. Uh, after that, we have another big fan favorite character who is Carl Jacobs, you know, from Mr. Beast. Um, Carl's character is a time traveler who is losing his memory with each leap through time. He's also currently the leader of one of the newer factions on the server, the Kanoko Kingdom. We'll be talking about Carl Jacobs a little bit more in a bit when we talk about Tales of the S&P. After that, we have H-Bomb, who is a kind of, you know, back burner side character lore-wise who's very, very kind and neutral. Their two big things are, number one, they run around, dress as a cat maid, harassing people, Fundy in particular, because it's really funny and it's a good bit. Um, and they are also the host of the Past, which we'll be talking about in a wee bit. After that, we have, you know, the man, the myth, the legend, the blood god, Technoblade, whose character is, yes, uh, Technoblade, if you want to watch, like, short videos explaining, like, the major lore events he's involved with, his are a pretty good place to start if you don't want to watch, like, multi-hour long VODs. So, uh, there you go for that. Technoblade's character is a radical anarchist and a renowned fighter. He's usually very, very calm, but gets extremely wrathful if he feels he's been wronged. Uh, he also hears voices that compel him to violence, and he is the founder of, again, a very recent faction, the Syndicate. After that, we have Ant Frost, who is a member of the Badlands. I cannot remember where I read this, but I'm pretty sure it's been said a few times that Ant is a house cat in netherite armor, and that's hilarious to me. Um, Ant is usually very, very kind and somewhat quiet. Unfortunately, he is currently possessed. Okay, guys, this is our last character slide, so uh, bear with me. Bill's a Minecraft, you know, the dude who created Minecraft in collaboration with Hatsune Miku? He's a fucking hero. Uh, he's also canonically Will's father and his killer. You know, family tree type thing. Phil is one of the few characters who does not have three lives. He only has one, but as a trade-off, he is several centuries old. Uh, he often works for what he sees as a great, as like the greater good, but he fails to understand how that can hurt individuals thanks to the ruthless efficiency he works with. Like, if he thinks someone's doing something morally abject, instead of being like, you there, stop doing that, he will just fucking kill them. Like, technically, that is absolutely the most efficient way to get someone to stop, but it's probably not the best answer. Uh, canonically, Phil once had a set of wings that he could use to fly, which is kind of a reference to how he's portrayed in fan art for his hardcore series and his love of Electra flying, but he lost those wings trying to protect Wilbur shortly before his death. It's a pretty neat canon reason for why a man known for using an Elytra cannot do so in a world that does not have access to or knowledge of the existence of the end. And I think that's neat. Uh, Connor Eats Pants is genuinely one of my favorite people on this server, because while everyone else is freaking out and doing lore, he's just doing a Minecraft Let's Play and his character skin's just him in a Sonic onesie. He is the fucking hero of our time. Um, he, again, he was not really heavily involved in lore until very recently with the aftermath of a Tales of the SMP episode, but even to what extent that puts him in line with the lore is kind of unknown. After that, we have Captain Puffy, or just Puffy, who is everyone's mom friend and is kind of the only person who is patching creeper holes around this server. She is one of the few characters who is a state possession and is currently either adopting every person on the server that she can or helping them through therapy with her therapy office. The next two characters we are going to go over are the co-founders of Boomerville, and that would be Vicstar123, who has helped make many a childhood, mine included, and Laserbeam, who enjoys yelling, get off my lawn to people. Unfortunately for him, he gets mugged a lot. <sighs> Poor Laser. 
I feel so bad, dude. Um, after that, we have Ranbu, who is very much a fan favorite character. Um, before Ludwig did his um, nonstop subathon, where every time you give him a sub, the length of time he has to keep streaming goes up, um, Ranbu became the most sub to person on Twitch in order to raise money for the Trevor Project, which is very, very sweet. He seems like a good kid, you know? Ranbu's kind of been, like, the main protagonist for some of these newer arcs. Uh, as a character, they are a half-Enderman with memory trouble, who very, very much hates factions and kind of sways towards the anarchists to get rid of them. Uh, due to his memory trouble, he has these instances where he blacks out and he commits crimes, but even he doesn't quite know what the extent of what he does is, right? After that, we have Foolish Gamers, uh, who is some kind of god of life and death, and canonically, he's like mostly a totem of undying. Um, but people like to draw him as a totem just wearing a shark hoodie, which I think is quite cute. He also carries around a totem of undying with him named Foolish Junior. Um, also, at some point, Puffy adopted him. Like, she looked at a god and said, this one's mine now. And you know what? Good for her. Uh, thankfully for all of us, despite Foolish often calling lightning down on people he doesn't like, he's quite friendly. After that, we have Hannah Rose, who I think has the cutest house in the server. She's got this cute little pink cottage made up of crimson planks, and it's just precious. She also might be like a spirit of springtime or a nature spirit of some sort, but um, we don't really know yet because she's very, very new lore-wise. We just know that like her health is kind of connected with flowers, like if they're doing well, she's doing well type thing, and if they're not, she's dying. Um... IRL, she's kind of a fucking freak at Bed Wars, like, not gonna lie, one of the best players in the game, I think. And last but not least, we have Charlie Slimesicle, funny pun man. Uh, he is part of my favorite d, &D podcast, just roll with it. Uh, and Charlie hasn't really been on the server much, but when he is, he's just a fucking delight. So, I thought it would be funny to have the cast and the cast back to back, and I'm right, that is funny. Um, but LaCast is a podcast with the cast where they do rodcasts. I think Steven would love this because it's a fishing mini game. Um, basically what LaCast is, is HBOM has on different creators on the server and he just kind of has like a back and forth interview with them like, oh, what do you like about your character? How do you feel about the lore? Would you rather type games? And he streams that all on Twitch and then condenses it into a YouTube video later. I want more people to watch LaCast and also to appreciate HBOM for genuinely being one of the chillest people I've ever seen on the internet. Uh, he recently hit his 10-year anniversary live streaming, and that's like a pretty big milestone, and, you know, good for him. We're not going to sit here and watch it, but I have included the latest episode of LaCast in the slideshow, which is uh, Foolish and Jack Manifold. We're not watching it, though, alas. So, uh, again, much like characters, I don't need you to remember all the factions verbatim. Just keep in mind that there are a lot of you know, chess pieces kind of moving around. The first and oldest faction on the server is the Greater Dream SMP, currently led by King Eret, but founded by Dream. Uh, other members include Callahan, Puns, Captain Puffy, H-Bomb, Alyssa, and Punk. This is generally like a catch-all for people who don't align with other factions in the server, and it controls most of the area around spawn, like the community house shown here. Um, until Dream's recent imprisonment, the kingship was just kind of a puppet government, and now Eret is stuck picking up the pieces. One of the other major factions still standing is the Badlands, which is a coalition union between Bad, Ant, Sam, and Skeppy. It's mostly looking to intervene in server conflicts as a means of gaining power and land. Bad is technically the leader, but most of the other members have an equal dis like, say in decision making. A subcategory of the Badlands, though, is the Eggpire, which is an alliance consisting of most of the Badlands and other server members currently possessed by the Egg, namely Bad Ant and Puns. So anyway, uh, here's a fucking sick animatic explaining the Badlands' morals set to the fucking beat of the room where it happened from Hamilton. No audio? Oh, that's an L. Oh, well, moving on then. You can watch these later. I'll send you the presentation. After that, we have Snowchester, which is an independent commune slash research facility founded by Tubbo. It's a cozy little snow village with cabins and whatnot and a fucking nuclear facility in the basement. 
Its members include Frobo, Jack Manifold, Foolish, Ranbu, Puffy, and Slimesicle. Erin is also technically granted membership as a foreign ambassador, and it's most notable, aside from the nukes for its cozy looking outfits. Ain't they cute? They do look very comfy. After that, we've got Boomerville, uh, which is where Vic and Laser like to hide from the Zoomers. It's also basically the headquarters for the Church of Channel memberships, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Uh, they really disliked the Manberg when it was still kicking and are currently backing the anarchists. Uh, they also pretty much, you know, dislike anyone under the age of 30. You know how I talked about Laser getting mugged a lot? If fucking people rob their house a lot too, which really doesn't help anything. Um, whenever they have server guests on for the day, Carl Jacobs is supposed to, you know, go around and give them a tour, and then they build, like, a little house to commemorate the visit. Um, and most often, instead of, you know, getting the materials himself, Carl just breaks into their house and steals shit. Um, to the right we have- sorry, what? Oops, I agree. Uh, to the right, we have the Kanoko Kingdom. The flag is designed by at Estichu on Twitter, which uh, this was originally a fan design, but it was picked as the official flag later, which is really, really neat. Hey, your artist for doing nice stuff. Um, so the Kanoko Kingdom is a country founded by Carl, Sapnaf, and George that holds Carl's library, which is kind of significant to the lore of Tales of the SMP, which we'll get to. Uh, it's mushroom themed because uh, Kinoko means uh, mushroom in Japanese and it's in a flower forest and it's very, very cute and pretty. Um, whenever Carl can't think of the name for something in English, he just describes it very, very literally or just the noun in a different made, uh, language. So their little mushroom kingdom can't be mushroom kingdom because that's, you know, in Mario. So it's Kinoko kingdom now. I think the other most notable example of Carl doing the naming thing is he named an other underwater city Mizu, which literally just means water city. <laughs> so uh, these next two factions have a lot of overlap and there's like a massive debate if they should even be considered separate entities at all um, but for you know like the separation of powers here we're just going to consider them separate for a bit so there's the Arctic Anarchist Commune which is a snowy community following anarchist values um, it, the land is owned by Technoblade but Phil and Rambo live there too Tommy and it lived there for a hot minute but some plot happened and that's not a thing anymore the whole thing is just a really, really big reference to the Antarctic Empire from SMP Earth. I don't know how many of you know about that, but uh, one time Technoblade and Phil said, uh, the world is mine by Hatsune Miku, and it was theirs. Uh, after that is, yeah, after that there is the Syndicate, which is an anarchist organization seeking to destroy all governmental factions. It is currently headquartered in the Stronghold, though canonically no one even knows what the end is. Um, there's a humorous anecdote about Dream XD descending from the sky and breaking the end portal to prevent anyone from using it, and then having to be gently convinced by Phil and Techno that they don't even know what it is. They just thought it would make a pretty bitch and fable, and as you can see by the image in front of you, they were right. Um, the members are kind of free to act or not on their own volition. Like, hey, do you want to go take down this government this week? No, sorry, dude, I can't. I'm morally against killing those people specifically. Oh, sure, dude, that's fine. Because freedom of choice is a big thing in anarchist values. Uh, the members of the syndicate are, include Techno, Phil, Mickey, and Rambu, and then an unnamed member codenamed Hippocrates. All of the members actually have names referencing ancient Greek myth. Um, Techno is Protesilaus who was the first Greek to fall in the Trojan War. Filza is Zephyrus, the god of the west wind, who's often depicted with a set of wings. Nikki is Nemesis, the god of revenge. And Rambu is Lethe, the spirit of forgetfulness, and that funky fucking river in the underworld that makes you forget shit. Get it? Because he has memory problems? That's funny. There's also a couple of currently uh, defunct factions that we should talk about because they are very important. There is Le Manberg under the Wilbur administration, which was an independent nation formed out of a drug empire made as a safe place for all Europeans on the server. Members included President Wilbur Soot, VP Tommy, Secretary of State Pavel, Bundy, you know, Wilbur's kid, Jack Manifold, Nikki, and Eret. Uh, Eret would later betray the nation to become king of the SMP. It was technically a dictatorship, but was arguably the most stable the country ever was. 
After that is Manberg, Schlatt's administration, which is a corrupted Lemanberg following the election fallout. Don't worry, we'll get to it. Schlatt declared himself emperor, oppressed pretty much everyone who disagreed with him, and kind of drove everyone away to join the Pogtopian resistance. Its members included Schlatt, Quacky, George, Fundy, Nikki, Tubbo, who was a spy, Jack, and Punk. Jack would go on to secede to create Manifold Land, Nikki, Quackity, Fundy, and Punk affected Pogtopia, and of course, Tubbo was a spy all along. There's also, you know, Lemanberg under the Tubbo administration, which was reestablishing Lemanberg following the Manberg Pogtopian War and the bombing that occurred. Don't worry, we'll get to it. Outwardly, it was a fairly stable administration, but it was fraught with this kind of internal strife over exiles and tracking down Technoblade for his war crimes. We'll get to it. Lemanberg fell for the last time during the Doomsday War with the destruction costing it its last canon life. After that, there's no more Lemanbergs. Its members included Pebo, Quackity, Fundy, Rambu, Nikki, Carl, and Tommy before his exile. There was also Pogtopia, which was the resistance to Manberg and Schlatt following the exile of Wilbur Soot and Tommy Kennett, based in a ravine in the woods. Um, I normally try to find, like, non-face-cammed photos so you can just, like, look at the scenery, but the only good screen grab I have of Pogtopia is from Wilbur's stream, so... We'll be scoots on screen, yay! It do be like that. Its members included Wilbur, Tommy, Techno, Punk, Tubbo, Nikki, Quackity, and Fundy. Here are a couple honorable mentions that I, for your sake, I do not have time to go over. I think my personal favorite is Little Penis Land by Connor Eats Pants. That's just fucking funny. Connor's just funny. Good for him. Uh, there are also just two locations I want you to be aware of that aren't factions, but they kind of come up a lot during lore, so it's worth knowing them by name. There's the Community House, which is the first build on the server, and it's essentially considered its heart. You can't really get anywhere on the server without passing through it directly. Um, and the images of it here are before and after its destruction and restoration, because it does get destroyed. Um, after that, we have the Church of Prime and the Holy Land. I want to mention now that there are two canon religions quotation marks in the lore universe, one for those who stream on Twitch and the other for those who stream on YouTube. Um, the headquarters of the Church of Prime are dubbed the Holy Land. If you go here and you say, can I get some fucking primes, dude? They just fucking roll in. Um, the Holy Land is basically a universally recognized no killing zone. Like if you kill someone there, you're on timeout for a bit, Sunny Jim. So it's important. Um, there's also the three lives system. Most of the characters have three canon lives. These aren't normal in-game deaths like Tommy and it fell into lava four times in a row. Canon deaths are story-relevant deaths that are purposely scripted and plot-related. The most notable exception to the three rule is Filza, who only gets one. Uh, this entire concept wasn't actually canon itself until like midway through Manberg Pogtopia when things got really story-heavy. Resurrection is still possible in this universe. There's the Book of Necromancy, and also Jack Manifold just got so pissed he said, no, I'm not dead, and he came back. Um, I would also like to say the uh, image I have here is a thumbnail from a YouTube video by user Kinda Coral. Um, Sapnap still has three lives. It's just a good image. He still has three lives. Let's not be erroneous here. Okay, so Tales of the SMP, I think, is one of my favorite parts of the series. Tales is a really, really unique way to get into the series because each episode is a self-contained story with a clear start and end, and they're usually just really fun to watch and are funny. Um, so Carl's time traveler character is sent to each event by a mysterious presence in a land called the In-Between, where he is tasked with witnessing and recording what transpires before him. These episodes are written and directed by Carl Jacobs, featuring a rotating cast of new characters played by members of the SMP. Uh, these are all usually connected to current events in the story because, you know, characters are the descendants of, or ancestors of people or entities and places reoccur. Like, uh, for example, Punk is canonically aware that one of his ancestors, a farmer named Jack, who was a character in the village that went mad, existed. Uh, there's also multiple characters in episodes like The Lost City of Mizu and The Masquerade that are outright stated to be or are heavily implied to be related to current characters. Uh, so the episode list is as follows. The town that went mad was speed building a town that Carl then blew up. Um, the village that went mad was a Minecraft game of Town of Salem. It was the first, like, actually um, 
aired live episode of the series. There is the beach episode, which was a very, very fun pirate-themed treasure hunt. It's one of the most wholesome streams I've ever watched. Uh, I did not know I wanted Sapnap and Rambu to interact before then, but I do know I want them to interact again now. There's the Lost City of Mizu, which is my favorite episode, I think. Uh, a group of fishermen discover an underwater city and its last remaining inhabitant. And this uh, retells the lore of the SMP as though it's been distorted through hundreds of years. There's the Masquerade, which is a murder mystery with some very frightening connections to current lore. There's the Wild West, where Carl saves a town from a group of bandits. There's the Haunted Mansion, where Jay Schlatt's ghost kidnaps a bunch of frat boys and then makes the remaining friends run an obstacle course to save them. Uh, and then the most recent episode, which was last week, I think, actually, is The Pit, which is set a year before the events of Mizu. It is a gladiatorial tournament to become the general of King Porcius VII, uh, who's played by Technoblade, by the way. Um, I'd say that, like, Mizu's really where the series hit its stride and figured out what it was, you know, going to do. And it's, Mizu and the Masquerade are just great episodes. I say Mizu's my personal favorite because the setting was really, really fun to explore and watch. Um, and as a fledgling historian, seeing how the events of the story are told from hundreds of years in the future and are heavily distorted amuses me and gives me great satisfaction. Uh, the characters everyone plays are also really, really fun. And it's very, very self-aware in a lot of aspects because the main antagonist of that episode is a homicidal dream span played by Dream. Like, that's just funny. Um, the in-between is also so goddamn pretty. Like, I can't wait to, like, get to look around that place more. Um, but apparently something sinister lies beneath the surface of this pristine but empty palace. Perhaps there is an other side. And I'm winking at you right now, Chloe. I know you can't see it, but I am winking at you because there is an other side, which I'm not going to show you. Anyway, now we can talk about the actual timeline. <laughs> I told you, this is going to take a really fucking long time. <laughs> I tried to, I, dude, I tried to warn you. How's, how's Rio and the rest of the lads doing? Are they still alive? <laughs> What do they say? <laughs> mm, Orgar, respectable, respectable reason to ditch Lord. It's okay. For Borg, I'd portray everyone here for a Borgar if it was a good enough Borgar. So it better be a good, good Borgar. I like food, man. You know that. Hey, only if it's a good Borgar. If it's a bad one, I'd never. Anyway, so hey man, before we get to the events of the story, please understand, all of the characters are the heroes of their own story, and other characters are sometimes the villains of those stories. There's no single morally good character, everyone does something wrong at some point, and there are only one or two full-on antagonistic figures that are, like, the clear, like, hey guys, this is the bad man, um, to many people. Basically, everyone's kind of like this unreliable narrator, and you don't really get a good sense of who right or wrong if you're watching from multiple perspectives, right? Uh, granted, for much of the series, Tommy's the most prominent character we deal with. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, Tommy's the most prominent character and catalyst of events. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kane. Uh, thusly, much of the series and lore is framed with him as like our nominal protagonist and our litmus for good and evil. So, hey, this is, yeah, I know, right? This is the, uh, <laughs> I know, right? I know, right? <laughs> I will explain. So this is the S&P... I did not say that, no. Um, oh! <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, so this is the S&P timeline. I <laughs> please stop, please, please. Please, I'm gonna die. Um, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm fly I'm trying to do a lecture. Please don't interrupt my class, good sir. <laughs> anyway, um, 
who uh so this is the current smp timeline that is up on the fandom wiki and if this looked confusing at all i'm so fucking sorry um i'm coming up on like a year's worth of information that i'm trying to convey to you and i cannot clarify all of it no matter how badly i try but i'm trying to get certain events down for you here's another iteration of the timeline um i would also like to note that certain events that are not present on the SMP are still considered canon events that are known to have happened in the lore. For example, Quackity is absolutely terrified of Technoblade because of the events they experienced together during Minecraft Mondays, you know, the Minecraft tournament set up by Keemstar. Um, that's the canon reason for the dynamic they have, though. Like, that happened and I have to deal with the consequences of it. Um, some conversations that the streamers have together on Twitter are also considered to be canon events, or they are at least, like, reflective of a character's thoughts in canon. And I'm also pretty sure that the Dream vs. Techno Duel is a canon thing that happened. Don't quote me on that, I'm not really sure. Um, but there are just some things, like, I can't possibly mention in this summary because, like, hey, they happened on Twitter, I don't know if that's super important. And, like, also the things that did happen, happened a lot, so I can't include all of it. I'm kind of parsing down an entire year's worth of almost daily content from multiple perspectives on several hour streams. I am giving you the best summary I can, but I am cutting down on a lot of shit. So in the beginning, <laughs> before Tommy in it. Um, for each era that I start, I'm gonna, you know, tell you the, the name of the era um, and their, reflect their respective slides are going to follow a pretty similar format. I'm going to say the error name, the players that get added, a short description. Um, I might mention major builds or, like, when certain items change hand. Uh, and then, of course, the key events that, you know, make up the lore. Some of these categories are going to go on a lot longer than others, especially as time goes on. And by that, I mean lore events happen more and a lot. So before Tommy in it, it was a time of relative peace. It was a normal survival server played on by the friends Dream, George, Sapnap, Callahan, Sam, Alyssa, Ponk, and Bad. Uh, during this time period, we see the first iteration of the community house get built. Um, Ponk's first lemon tree is built, and then George burns it down as he is moving on the right side, and then it gets rebuilt. I am highlighting this fucking tree because it has its own Wikipedia page for how many times it has been burnt down and rebuilt. Um, I also want, <laughs> yeah, I also really want people to know that one of its iterations is named Thicatron. It's not at all lore relevant, I just want you to know that they named it Thicatron. Um, yeah, Ponk's a funny dude. Um, the first courthouse is also built during this time period where George is put on trial for the death of Sapnap's pet horse, Joffrey. The nether hub is also built, um, and the fish Beckerson is caught. Beckerson is a very, very dear pet fish to Sapnap. Uh, Dream's pet horse spirit also gets killed, and Sapnap tries to make it a grave, and then he accidentally uses one of the leather that spirit dropped to make an item for him. Oops. <laughs> Oopsie doodles. And then he came, he came onto this world, big man in it. So, new players for AT after Tommy include the man, the myth, the legend himself, Tommy in it, Tobo, Fundy, Huns, Purpled, Wilbur, Schlatt, Skeppy, and Eric. Schlatt is later banned because he wasn't actually supposed to be whitelisted in the first place. <laughs> um, oops. Uh, after Tommy is a time of mild shenanigans where nothing too crazy is happening, except it's the beginning of the longest running fight on the server, the Disc Saga. Uh, but before the Disc Saga happens, the Socializing Club is built to uh, solve the beef between Fundy, Tubbo, and Purpled in a civil manner instead of a year-long scrap over, you know, vinyl records. But we'll talk about the significance of the vinyl records eventually, just, you know. Um, other notable builds of the time period include the sewer system, Eretz Castle, the second lemon tree, you know, so on and so forth. 
So the disk saga happens, um, and the reason that that happens is uh, Sapnap gets, you know, angry one day and burns down, uh, burns down the second lemon tree, right? So Punk and Alyssa burn his house down because arson, you know, is responded to with arson. Sapnap and Tommy then team up and kill them repeatedly for this transgression. Dream tries to intervene to stop the fight, but gets killed himself. Um, and so as punishment for this, Dream goes to steal Tommy's prized possessions, the music this Mellow High and Cap. Uh, Sapnap, Tommy, and Tubbo then fight Dream to get those back because, hey man, those are mine. And then Dream steals them back again. And then Tommy tries to like scam Dream for the discs, being like, I'll give you X many diamonds if you drop them. But the discs that Dream gives him aren't actually his. Uh, and finally, Tommy and Tubbo trade a netherite chest plate for the actual discs, and then they get put in the ender chest for safekeeping. This puts an end to the hospi uh, hostilities for now, but just know that, like, this is the beginning of those two discs becoming a very big deal. So, hey, man, <laughs> it's the part where Hamilton happens, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know... Uh, there are no new players. Oh, what's up? Happens to the best of us. Sometimes you just reinvent Hamilton in a video game, but more. Um, there are no new players for the era of the War for Lamanberg's Independence. This is also kind of the last era where things are like relatively straightforward and you only need to watch one or two point of views to get the gist of it. So buckle up, buddy. We're going to go for a bumpy ride. <laughs> the Europeans secede from the rest of the server. It's Hamilton, and before you know it, it goes Game of Thrones. Um, this era is most famously portrayed by the saddest animatic war, which I guess we can't watch anymore because Chloe says we don't have audio, and that sucks, dude. But, like, what can you do? I, I guess we could. Uh, but uh, let me finish my slide first and we'll give it another go. Uh, notable builds include the Camar van, which is a hot dog van, um, which is just a cover-up for a drug front, uh, and then the walls of Lemanberg. Wilbur and Tommy try to start a drug empire within the Camar van. Drugs isn't a potion business, but they call them drugs. Uh, and then some Americans try to stop them. Frustrated, Wilbur, Tommy, and Tubbo create their own SMP within the server, dubbing it Lemanberg and surrounding it with concrete walls. Lemanberg. Uh, named at the time because it was only dudes, like, there was one girl on the server and she was not part of this at the time that this happened. Um, but they also wanted to make it sound really European, so they just slapped that L apostrophe in front of it and called it a day. Anyway, uh, tell me if you can hear this, I guess. Anything, Chloe? L. Oh, well. You should watch that in your spare time. It's a good animatic. Sadis is very, very, yeah, she's very, very talented, and honestly, like, she, like, watching her improvement as she produces more animatics is incredible. Um, she posted on Twitter, like, yesterday that she's, like, 99% done with the one she's working on right now, and frankly, I'm excited to see it. Um, so, uh, by the way, at some point, it is established that Bundy, you know, Wilbur's son, is canonically born within the walls of Lemanberg, and thusly he is the only citizen with Jusoli, i.e. birthright citizenship, and that has absolutely zero bearing on the plot. I just think it's a really weird fact. Um, so, Wilbur drafts the Declaration of Independence. I did not spell independence wrong. He did. Um, in response, Dream declares war on Lemanberg. So the fight shapes up to be Dream, George, Sapnap, and Puns versus Wilbur, Tommy, Tubbo, Fundy, and Aaron. This begins with the Dream S&P TNT cannoning the wall surrounding Lemanberg and then burning down Tubbo's fucking house, with Dream issuing the warning, I want to see white flags, white flags outside your base by tomorrow, at dawn, or you are dead. After the Battle of the Two Towers, it appears that the Dream SMP retreats, leading Lemanberg to believe that they've actually won the fight. Eret then leads them to believe he has more supplies for a future skirmish in a bunker, and he leads the group to a room called the Final Control Room. This is a trap. Eret betrays the group, allowing the Dream SMP to attack, and Eret utters, Down with the revolution, boys. It was never meant to be, which is arguably the most famous line that's ever come out of the series. 
I personally can never hear the phrase, it was never meant to be again without having flashbacks. But, you know, Eret sounded cool when he did it, so it's fine. Um, this ambush, though, costs Wilbur, Tommy, Fundy, and Tubbo one cannon life each, which is not good. So Dream and Wilbur meet to negotiate, where Wilbur gives the Independence Ford death speech. Uh, Dream didn't like that too much, so he just kind of blows up like a solid chunk of Lamanberg. Oopsie doodle. Ooh, sometimes you get mad and you just... TNT, you know? Hmm? Yeah, it happens to the best of us. Lamanberg retreats to Tommy's obsidian bunker beneath the Camar van, where Wilbur resigns himself to the idea of surrender. During the next meeting with Dream to arrange this, Tommy, a very hot-headed child, challenges Dream to a bow duel to settle things once and for all. If Tommy wins, Lamanberg gains independence. If he loses, he surrenders one of his prized discs to Dream. The duel commences and Tommy loses real fucking bad, dude. Oops. He also loses his second life with this stunt. Yowza. However, Tommy, you know, cares about his friends and whatnot, so Tommy surrenders both of his discs to Dream in exchange for Lamanberg being acknowledged as an independent nation. A new, still incorrectly spelled Declaration of Independence titled Decree is drafted, formalizing independence. It includes some of my favorite pages, including page four. Yo! And page six. Suck it, green boy. Wilbur starts the same as the president of Lamanberg, and the war comes to a close. Meanwhile, in exchange for the Supreme Dream, Eric is formally crowned king of the SLP. It's a new era, baby. Let's go. Our... Really? Oh, that sucks. Ah, uh, yo, and suck it, green boy. The only pages that matter. But I digress, lads. Um, welcome to the Lemanberg election and electoral fallout. I would say, like, this part up and through the Manberg Pogtopia conflict to its end is my personal favorite part of the series. Like, this shit was genuinely cool to watch go down in real time. There were, like, polls to decide what characters did and, you know, like, surprise streams and whatnot. It was really neat. Um, the ongoing arc seems to be building up that same level of hype, though, and I'm frankly excited to see it. So our new... Uh, maybe, maybe Wilbur's perspective. I know he condenses a few videos on the time period. Um... Yeah, if you don't want to go back and watch, like, several hour VODs. I don't know, I'll go, I'll go looking for you. I'll go looking for you. Yeah, I'll see what I can do. No problem. Our new cast of characters coming onto the server during this time period are Jack Manifold, Nikki Niachu, Quackity, Carl Jacobs, H-Bomb, Technoblade, and Ant Frost. Uh, so this is the part where some of, like, the Game of thrones s politics come in, where, like, assassination becomes a viable strategy and, like, the drama happens. Um, but before we talk about the election, I do need to mention some kind of important things that do happen. Um, firstly, wearing armor is banned within Lemanberg by Wilbur's soot to prevent infighting. Uh, Skeppy trades uh, one of Spirit's remaining leather for Tommy's disc cat. Tommy, real sick of Sapnap murdering all of his fucking pets, tries to hide his new pet cow, Henry, in his vacation home. Uh, and the railway skirmish occurs. Uh, which is where uh, Tommy riding a minecart hits Dream and kills him on impact. <laughs> Somehow not a canon death. I know, I know. It should be, though. It should be. Um, the first pet war also occurs, and I do not have time to cover the pet wars. Just assume if it's a war about pets. Sapnap started it. Um, but I do mention this pet war because some very, very important items changed hands during this time. Uh, that is... Tommy steals Beckerson and Mars, Sapnap's pet fish, and gives them to Dream, but he also gets his copy of Melahai back. Um, other important things that happen include Nikki Niachu designing and building the flag of Lemanberg, and later Carl and Fundy helping her build the election podium. Sapnap and Carl also get engaged. I don't talk about it too much, but as like the plot goes on, uh, those two and Quackity form like a thruple thing, and eh, yeah, they're happy together. Okay, so we can get to the... <laughs> Oh, 
it was at the time. Yeah, it's been retconned. <laughs> oh, is it canon? Huh. Interesting, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Someone tell the wiki writers. Someone tell the wiki writers. Someone tell the wiki writers. Okay, but that aside, we can actually talk about the fucking election now. Holy shit. Um, so President Wilbur Soot's mental health began to decline rapidly due to the internal strife in the Manberg, hence having to ban the act of wearing armor to keep people like, hey, okay, no scrapping. Uh, he also sort of recognizes that, like, hmm, it's dubious and it looks bad for me to declare myself president. And so he's like, oh, I'll hold an election to make myself look more legitimate. I really want to stress this shit here because people in the fandom misinterpret certain characters a lot and Wilbur's like a prime example of this. The election was not held because it was the right thing to do. It was held as a selfish act by Wilbur to maintain his power and status. He made things purposely difficult to prevent people like Quacken and Fundy from trying to run against him, right? Uh, and I wouldn't call this explicitly evil yet, but like it's kind of a shit thing to do. It's not morally upright or anything. And I highlight this because Wilbur does go, you know, full fucking postal one of these days and actually be evil. But at this point, he's just kind of being selfish. Um, but those selfish tendencies do, you know, kind of snowball into evil as time goes on. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so sad I cannot play the Vic Star endorsement to you. It was the funniest fucking day of my godforsaken life watching a clip of the man who made my goddamn childhood go and endorse fucking Pog 2020 aired live on Twitch. The sheer volume of serotonin I received on that day alone has carried me through most of the pandemic. Also, this happened before Vicstar formally joined the server. So this was just some, like, up-and-coming 16-year-old Twitch streamer begging him on Twitter day after day for an endorsement, and then he just did it? Thank you, Mr. One, two, three. Thank you. So uh, some debates take place during this time period, uh, and this is also kind of where the, the joke of everything being George's fault originates, because he slept through most of these, you know, debates, right? And Quackity and the others like later posited that had he actually showed up to help campaign before the ballots were cast, the results could have been different. Which, I mean, fair, Goggy's got a lot of fans, right? So our primary parties and the final ones on the election ballot are Pog 2020, run by Wilbur and Tommy, and endorsed by the Vicstar123. There is Swag 2020, which is Quackity and George, allegedly uh, endorsed by KSI, but they never actually, you know, you know, got the like, yup, that's the one I want. Uh, then there is Coconut 2020, which is Fuddy and Nikki. And then Schlatt got unbanned from the server, specifically so he could endorse Pog 2020. And then he said, fuck it, and ran his own campaign. Schlatt 2020, baby. You got a lot. You, what a fucking man, dude. Fucking goat man. Uh, anyway, a poll was launched for the viewers and fans, technically citizens of Lemanberg, um, to decide who won the election. Uh, behind the scenes, Wilbur and Quackity agreed that parties may pool their um, votes together to create a coalition government win. Uh, the coalition agreement was conducted while Schlatt started hunting people down with a crossbow and um, Quackity and Wilbur were hiding. From that, <laughs> uh, Schlatt is genuinely, it's so fucking funny, dude. He's genuinely, like, one of the funniest fucking elements on this server. Like, he can, he can do the serious scenes when he feels like it. Like, the speech after the election is, like, weirdly chilling. Why, when did he pull out the theater kid card, you know? Um, but sometimes he just chooses chaos and starts chasing bitches down with a crossbow. Um, so, you know, days later, we get the final res- It really does say a lot about society. 
Days later, everyone arrives at the election podium for the unveiling of the results. As you can see them below Vic Starr's glorious, glorious face with the Lemanberg flag flying behind him. Um, initially, with having a popular vote of 45%, Tommy is led to believe that he and Wilbur have won. However, Schlatt and Quackity acted on the allowance of a coalition pooling of their votes, leading to a combined total of 46%, beating Pog 2020 by one point. Schlatt and Quackity are, yeah, that's fucking bonkers, isn't it? Um, Schlatt and Quackity are respectively the president and vice president of the Mandarin. No, Vicstar, we can't hear you. Goodbye. Oh, Vicstar. So the electoral fallout, my dude. Uh, Schlatt declares himself Emperor of Lemanberg and then orders the exile of Wilbur and Tommy. While fleeing, Wilbur is shot in the back by puns, costing him his second life. After he eventually respawns, Wilbur and Tommy flee to a cave in a hill deep in the woods. Eric attempts to, you know, hit him, hit him up in a call and aid them, but they get rebuffed. Because, you know, Tommy and Will don't want to work with the person who betrayed them. Um, upon an attempt to return and spy on what's going on, Wilbur witnesses the walls of Lemanberg being torn down, and as a result of all this, Wilbur's mental issues kind of spiral because, like, oops, I'm on the run, my country's, you know, hunting me down. Technoblade, a government-hating anarchist, joins the server and agrees to help the Brits currently shacked up in a ravine. They dub their new home Pogtopia. After Pog 2020, get it? Funny. Yeah, true. Um, Schlatt then renames the nation to Manberg because they don't take no L's here and also L apostrophes to European. He promotes Tubbo, who is an active spy for Wilbur and Tommy, to the role of Secretary of State. Um, and it's also kind of clear from the outset that Schlatt and Quackity really have serious gripes with each other. Uh, and it's also revealed that Schlatt, as a character, is in extremely poor health and ends up on life support multiple times. Like, you know how it's a genuine marvel that, like, Prince Philip is still alive? That Schlatt is, like, the in-universe version of that, where he's dying every other week, but he just won't finally croak. Um... They, they uh, throw him down into a bed at night, so he's the only one laying there. And then he does like a... <sighs> as a bit. <laughs> it's a bit, but it wound up becoming canon as... A lot of things in this arc start as bits and then end up becoming canon. Uh, and that's the beauty of roleplay. Uh, it's during the first of these life support incidents where Quackity just kind of considers, like, oh, maybe I should fucking kill him and seize power. Um, like, that's how, like, fraught and, like, non-trusting their relationship is. Um, Fundy also initially plans to act as a spy, you know, to help out old Papa Wilbur Soot, uh, but he accidentally ends up growing closer to Flat rather than his own father, and he burns down the flag of Lemanberg to the horror of Nikki and Eret, who are aiding Pogtopia in secret, and I really want to stress how fucking cool Eric and Nikki are during this arc, and I can't cover all of it, but I want them to have more credit for the fandom from fucking speaking out against Schlatt, committing arson regularly, the spy work, the hoarding of TNT to use later. They're really fucking cool, and they don't get enough animatics for it. Um, Dream also seems to be aiding Pogtopia for some reason, though he claims it has to be in the shadows, and, you know, with the bias of hindsight, we know it's like, oh, he's just doing this to gain their trust for future crimes. Um, the animatic I would have really loved to play here is um, the channel without a name, a.k.a. Wolfie the Witness. Oh, who died? Oh, you all right, Rio, man? Hope you feel better, pal. Um, but yeah, no, Wolfie the Witch on Twitter. I think this is a really, really good animatic that covers the electoral fallout really, really well, but we can't see it because, I don't know, God said no to me. But, like, fucking trust me on that one, it's... Okay. So, Manberg, the Red Festival, and the Aftermath. If someone is unacquainted with the Dream SMP, but, like, no, like, crumbs of the lore... This is the time period, specifically the Red Festival, that everyone knows about. This shit was 
Yeah, this shit was buck fucking wild, dude, and is generally a fan favorite time period, rightfully so. Um, Cole, for your own viewing pleasure, this is one of the sections that Technoblade has a shortened video and summary of. Hell yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Techno's pretty good. He streams rarely, but when he does eventually make a YouTube video for the sections he has, they're pretty good summaries of the events that his character gets to experience, not necessarily everyone else's. Because remember, perspective and unreliable narrators. Um... But yeah, no, like, this shit's arguably the most iconic of events, right? So, uh, Schlatt and Quackity continue to have marital trouble, uh, specifically the Flatty Patty insult. As I said during character introductions, Quackity canonically has an absolute dump truck of an ass, and he takes great pride in this. Um, and he gets really, really hurt and insulted when it is implied that his ass is as flat as a sheet of paper. <laughs> So uh, this is one of the reasons why Quackity's super willing to betray Schlatt in, a, in you know, addition to all the other things he does. Uh, Fundy, during this time period, also rebuilds the Manberg flag out of obsidian in a black and, like, kind of orangey theme. And it's obsidian, so it's just a fucking pain in the ass to destroy you know, smart enough. Uh, it is also during this time period that Sapnap tries to kidnap Tommy's pet cow Henry as leverage and ends up killing him. Oops. Uh, this launches. <laughs> Oopsie doodles. This launches the War of the Burning Eiffel Tower, um, and it shapes up to be Sapnap, Aunt Skeppy, and Bad versus Tommy, Nikki, Dream, Techno, and Funds. The main conflict of this is the Battle of the Lake, where we get the famous I have the blade line from Tommy, and then Technoblade just fucking bursts in out of nowhere and starts kicking the shit out of people. It's really cool. Um, this is also Pogtopia's first major victory, um, because when they killed all these really, really well-geared-up people, they secured loot for Pogtopia to use in fighting. Uh, Dream also gives Tommy Sapnap's pet fish Mars as leverage. Also, fun fact about this fucking presentation, it was on this exact slide that I realized every time I typed Sapnap, my computer auto-corrected it to subpoena, which is hilarious. But also, I would... Hey, Cole, you know how I, like, my, I'm a legal studies major? It's, I know, I, I like, how my computer thinks I'm, I'm having, I'm just, I know. Alas, alas, I do not wish to subpoena Mr. Sapatus Napatus. I have no reason to make him waive his Fifth Amendment rights and compel him to speak on the witness stand. Please, Mr. Computer, please, I don't want to think about my criminal trial homework anymore, please. <laughs> Just want to think about haha -ha funny block man roleplay. So uh, another important thing that also happens, and I still don't know just how important it is yet because we haven't heard about them in a while, is uh, Tubby and uh, Tubbo and Fundy. Tubby, <laughs> Tubbo and Fundy found the Dream and Hunters, and they exercised Dream and split him from his demons, creating Dream XP. I don't fucking know either, dude. <laughs> don't ask me questions about this one. Um. They, they get together one more time later and Sapnap joins them, but they also haven't done too much lore-wise since, so I, I don't know the significance. But they do have cool outfits pictured here. The most important thing that happens is Schlatt announces the Manberg Festival, which is meant to be a celebration of how rich in democracy under our evil Republican overlord Jay Schlatt is. Uh, Tubbo made the uh, invitation, which was posted on Twitter. Good work, son. You did it. Uh, upon hearing of this event, Wilbur and Dream conspire to hide TNP across Manberg, intending to destroy the entire country during the event. Tommy, not wanting his fucking home to get blown up and just kind of wanting to beat the shit out of Jay Schlatt and reclaim power, realizes that Wilbur Soot has gone absolutely fucking postal, and Dream is not on his side in any fucking sense. 
So the Red Festival. <laughs> also, hey guys, I propose we we stop after the Manberg Pogtopia War and we do the rest of this on another night. What do you think? Fair enough? Yeah, I don't, because like, <laughs> we're only on like, I don't even, I, I think we're literally only on like slide 30 of like 50 something and like the information just gets more dense as we go on. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, split this into a a two part seminar, I think. Yeah. Uh, so the red festival, right? Schlatt, Quackity, Tubbo, and Fundy begin preparations, and by that I mean Tubbo and Fundy do all the work, and sometimes Carl Jacobs helps them too. Tubbo is set to make a speech during the event, and you know, as a spy for Wilbur, he is instructed to include a code word in the speech so that Wilbur knows if and when he should set off the, the uh, TNT. The invitations are sent and extended to all members of the server, Tactoblade included, but purposefully excluding Will and Tommy, who are in exile. The day comes and the festival proceeds mostly uninterrupted with Wilbur and Tommy watching from a distance. Tubbo gives his speech and does, in fact, include the code word, but Wilbur does not move to detonate the city. Schlatt then reveals that he knows Tubbo was a spy, and he entraps him on the stage. Schlatt then orders Technoblade, who easily succumbs to peer pressure, to execute Tubbo. And Techno does. He shoots him point fucking blank with um, a, like, really, really well-enchanted firework launching crossbow. Yeah, in the straight, like, he is two blocks away from Tubbo. It's, it's, the fandom interpreted this, yeah, oh, I'll get, to, I will get to it. I will get to it. Technoblade never dies. Uh, so yeah, Technoblade shoots Tubbo, costing him a canon life. He has been executed in public in front of everyone. And then Technoblade fucking snaps, dude. He just starts shooting everyone indiscriminately. And he, more, most importantly, uh, takes... Quackity and Schlatt's one life each, and then he flees. Um, as far as I'm aware, Quackity's death here has been retconned, so it didn't count as a canon death, but I am far too lazy to change this slide. Um, Tommy attempts to, you know, get onto the stage and stop Techno to save Tubbo, but he fails, and Wilbur fails to find the fucking button to detonate this. Wilbur forgot where in the hillside you were supposed to dig in to get to the room where he had set up the mechanism for the TNT. <laughs> but it's it's so fucking funny, dude. Um, but it's fine because we got more drama out of it later. Um, Techno then returns to protect Wilbur and Nikki who confront Schlatt for having Tubbo publicly executed. And again, I just want to highlight how much more attention Nikki Mia Chu deserves because her emotion during the Schlatt confrontation is like genuinely raw and good and her fear is showing. Um, but Techno comes back to protect the two as they retreat and they get back to Pogtopia safely. Upon returning to Pogtopia, Tommy's fucking pissed and berates Techno for hurting Tubbo because Tommy believes that Technoblade, who never dies, probably could have taken on the 15 people who would have tried to fight him for not shooting Tubbo. Um, and the two decide to settle their gripes with each other in a combat pit, uh, and then Tommy loses. Because how can you beat Technoblade at PvP? You can't. Um, I think this series of events is... Good job, Tommy. The series of events is, you know, like, most well explained through The Fall by Saddest, which, sorry, Chief, we can't watch. Gotta do that on your own time. It's your fucking homework. Um, so before we get... S yes. Technoblade was an English major before he dropped out of college. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Technoblade is an English major, respectfully. <laughs> He's the good English major. 
Yes, yes, he's redeemable, he's redeemable. Without compromising his morals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trigger warning, English major. God. <laughs> God. Anyway, so hey, before we talk about the aftermath of this wacky fucking shit that just happened, um, it's time to talk about some notable builds. Uh, Eret builds a museum where they take on the different artifacts in the server to preserve them historically, which I appreciate because it's me, History Bean. Um, someone builds a haunted mansion, I don't remember who. Uh, Tubbo and Sam decide to start draining the ocean surrounding an ocean monument so they can access it more easily and make it into a lock grinder. Um, also, it's not lore significant, but this is also the sp um, span of time where Thicatron gets built. You remember Thicatron, Punk's Lemon Tree that I talked about on slide 25? I remember Thicatron. Okay. <laughs> so the events of the festival kind of cause a major shakeup in, like, where loyalty lies on the server. Nikki and Tubbo are able to formally defect to Polytopia. Bundy begins acting more as a spy in the result of having, you know, a person he was friends with executed in front of everyone, and he records all of his intel in a diary. Uh, Quackity also thinks it's absolutely fucking insane to stage a public execution, so he's very, very wary of Schlatt and is literally ready to bolt at a moment's notice. Uh, during this time period, Ant, Bad, Sam, and later Skeppy formally established the Badlands, uh, and then the next day after the festival, uh, Schlatt and Quackity have a dispute about whether or not to keep the president's residence, um, which Quackity had built himself. Uh, and Schlatt starts, you know, taking the building down. So yeah, Quackity just fucking kills him. You know, maybe they don't break someone's house. It's fine. Uh, but this costs Schlatt his second life. And then Quackity promptly defects to Pogtopia. Wilbur... Can't help being a Gemini. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Mr. Quackity Alex is actually a Gemini. Um, sorry, I don't really know, need to know anything about his personal life like that. Oh well, can't help it. So uh, Wilbur later reveals the button room to Tommy and Big Q. The button room is a chamber behind the election podium that is laced with TNT and a button that would further set off more explosives around Manberg, should it be pushed. Um, one of the notable details about this place is Wilbur has scrawled the lyrics to the Le Manberg National Anthem into the walls. And that's metal as hell. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, Will kind of restates to the lads then that he's very intent on blowing Le Manberg up and destroying all of it for good, though you know, Tommy and Quackity convince him to not do that. For about like a day or two and then after Nikki Niachu's birthday party at the Haunted Mansion Wilbur decides he wants to blow up Manberg again oops um Quackity just barely manages to convince Will to wait until after he tries to get Schlatt to sign Manberg away through uh, a contract right or by assassinating him one of the two man's only got one life left why not uh, another thing that happens uh, during this time period is the second pet war. I do not have time to cover the second pet war. TLDR, Puns and Sapnap try and fight the Badlands to avenge the death of their pet panda dump truck. Go read it on the wiki if you want more than that. Another thing that happens pretty much at the exact same time as the second pet war, but is completely unrelated to it somehow, uh, is Sapnap kidnaps Tommy's pet horse, Horse. I know you see that word on screen. It is pronounced horse. I I can't do anything about that for you. That's just how Tommy decided to spell that thing's name. You. I, okay. Horse. The horse. Horse. There's a horse named Horse, but Horse. <laughs> J U O R S E. Horse. <laughs> you know it. 
So, uh, unfortunately for Quackity, that whole contract plan fails, and Schlatt reveals that he knows about the TNT. Quackity is, you know, under threat of his life. Oh, oh, sisters. Quackity's chased back to Pogtopia, where he meets up with Wilbur, Tommy, and Fundy, who decides to show up. Uh, Fundy then shows them his diary, which documents in detail Schlatt's declining health, as well as the lack of support he's getting from the citizenry. He pretty much stands alone. With this information, they prep for a coup of Manberg to stop Schlatt without having to destroy the country, knowing damn well he only has, like, two allies. The Badlands also pledge to back Pogtopia because they think they can get something out of it, and Graham reveals two very important things. Firstly, that Schlatt has given him an offer he can't refuse, so he has to back Manberg, and secondly, there is a traitor in Pogtopia. The thing that Schlatt gave Dream is later clarified to be the Book of Necromancy, which compels him to help Schlatt uh, in addition to his desire to see the destruction of Le Manberg or Manberg. It doesn't matter to him which side wins. He wants them both gone. If one disappears and the other is weakened by having to recover after the fight, it doesn't matter. His aim is served. He's evil. Uh, Wilbur also informs the group that if they do not win the war that's coming up, he's going to fucking detonate everything. So then we get the Manberg Pogtopia War, which is best illustrated through saddest animatic, The Dawn of the Sixteenth. I really like this one. It is the most recent one that she has released. However, as I said earlier, we have another one on the way, and I'm very excited to see it. So the new players we get to see during this single day event is Filza and Connor Eats Pants. Um, Before the fighting starts, Wilbur identifies a tree that appears to have been untouched since the beginning of the server, as in it was not, you know, destroyed at any point in any of the earlier wars, and is dubbed Lamantry, and all parties agree to leave it untouched. Dream as a gesture of good faith, whatever that qualifies for his character, agrees to encase it in obsidian, just in case any explosions go off, too. Um, Just before the fighting occurs, the final pet war happens, and I have to mention this one because horse fucking dies, Um, but as a gesture of peace afterwards, Sapnap releases his pet fish Mars at Tommy's request to say that, like, hey, now that neither of us have any pets, we can be friends again. King Eret refuses to side against Pogtopia, and as a result, they are overthrown by Dream. George is then crowned king in their stead, with the promise that the Greater Dream SMP remains neutral for fighting. <gasps> Sleepy King. Um, anyway, so November 16th. The war, you know, it's named Dawn of the 16th. Bad things happen on the 16th on this server. So Pogtopia, geared up primarily by Technoblade, consists of Will, Tommy, Thubbo, Techno, Quackity, Nikki, Eret, and Fundy. Uh, They are then aided by the Badlands, who withdraw their support once the fighting has properly finished. Uh, Jack and Purple are there too. Technically, they don't start there, but by the end of the fighting, they're like, I will get stabbed less if I stand with these people. Which, like, you know, fair. Uh, On the other side is Manberg, uh, geared up primarily by Dream and his mercenaries, consisting of Schlatt, Dream, Sapnap, Huns, and Carl. H-Bomb, George, Callahan, and Punk were neutral or not at all present to the event. In fact, George and Callahan were off building a cute little cottagecore hobbit hole house the entire time that all the explosions and shit were happening, continuing the tradition of George missing major events where he could have made a major difference. Um, I also want to say, uh, remember that the little hobbit hole house, because it kind of becomes important later, not for this arc, but for a later one. Pogtopia ends up being victorious in battle, and then Schlatt has a heart attack and fucking dies. I am not kidding. One time on stream, Wilbur Soot read out, like, the scenarios and, like, the way the script was supposed to go, and his exact wording was... Schlatt has a heart attack and fucking dies. <laughs> this costs Jay Schlatt his third and final life. Lemanberg is thusly reclaimed. Wilbur refuses the presidency because, 
I will talk about it in a second. And Tommy refuses because he knows that his disc situation is a major conflict of interest between him, Lamanberg, and Dream, and he really doesn't want that to get in the way of things. Tubbo, the Secretary of State, is thusly given the title as he is the next best choice. Wilbur leaves the celebration where, um, you know, people start tearing down the decorations to what was basically Tubbo's execution, and people feel they can finally, you know, get back to business as usual. And Wilbur goes to the button room, intent on detonating Lamanberg. He firmly believes that the nation he built cannot return anymore, and as far as he is concerned, if he can't have it, no one can. Just before he hits the button, Filza, his father, arrives and attempts to intervene. This is the first time Filza has been on the server, you know, when the cameras are rolling, right? So this is like, what? Filza Minecraft's here! Holy shit! It was really cool. It was really cool, actually. Please watch Dawn of the 16th by Sadis at your earliest convenience. Um, Will ends up hitting the button, despite Filza's best efforts. And after the explosion goes off, Wilbur begs his father to kill him which he does. He doesn't want to face the consequences of his actions. Simultaneously to this, Techno, who despises government and refuses to allow another one to rise, summons a bunch of withers to destroy everything for good. He does not believe that things could be different under the Tubbo administration. Uh-uh, it's not happening. After fighting off... <laughs> yeah, you know how it'd be. Uh, after the... Yes. <laughs> yup. <laughs> Subscribe. <laughs> Free propaganda. Uh, t fun fact about Techno. Yeah, they killed a lot of things. Um, a thing Technoblade has set up on his stream, which I didn't mention because I said ten words or less on character introduction slides, is um. Technoblade has what he calls the sellout timer, which is a, a timer he has on his phone and perpetually throughout his stream when it goes off, he will stop everything he's doing and he will just sit there for two minutes and go subscribe to Technoblade. Subscribe to Technoblade. <laughs> you, you respect the hustle, right? Um, it's so fucking good. Eventually, you know, Manberg's kind of reduced to a bit of a crater, and Technoblade and everyone who sided with him in the ensuing chaos makes their formal retreat. People, you know, realize that Wilbur's son is fucking dead, and now Tabo is president of a crater, and he has a lot of work to do. But it's okay, guys, because Connor Eats Pants joins the server right after this. We get Funny Man, Funny Man Connor in his Sonic onesie. Let's go. Um, yeah. So this is that's slide thirty six. I think it's prudent for all of our sakes that we stop for now. So uh, next time we'll be picking up with the Reconstruction Era. Do I have any other questions? No, no, there's no rampant racism and, and sharecropping and whatnot. It, it, you know, it's a bunch of other stuff. There's a little bit of pig. Pigism is a major theme throughout a lot of the Dream SMP, what with people calling Technoblade bacon all the time. Also, hey Cole, you should totally watch some Tales of the SMP episode because Technoblade plays a character. I love Tales of the SMP. Porkums. Tales of the SMP is so fucking good. Uh, Chloe, actually, if I'm going to send you anything, I'm going to send you the VODs for Tales of the s and because, like, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much content. Yeah. <laughs> and we're <laughs> okay I, I I drastically scaled down the amount of detail I was putting in these like by the end of Banford Pogtopia because I was like if I keep doing this 
this is going to go on for like 90 seconds. Oh, hey, Rio. How you feeling, man? Yeah, he's he's like six seven or some shit. Um, also, I'm not joking. Then and Rambo's a high schooler. Uh, the next tallest person I believe is Wilbur Soot. You know, a grown ass man who is six five. And I'm tired of all these tall people because it makes me feel inferior. <laughs> yeah, and then Tommy says he's six three, but Wilbur's adamant that he's six one. A lot of tall bitches on the server. And then Schlatt's six feet tall flat, right? <laughs> I guess. Can I have some of the tall juice, please? I would like to be tall. Anyway, I'm a... <sighs> Shit. Oh, <laughs> poor techno. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a cut my stream here. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Twitch.tv. Good